Uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, it's, it's really wonderful that so many people have turned up because it's not just about me, it's about the future of Fitzburg. It's about the, an area that you really care about. And um, I know it well. Uh, I grew up off Glenby Road uh, near McKee Barracks uh, and went to St. Vincent's CBS um, in, on Fingless Road. So I used to cycle to school via Fitzborough, um, often through droves of cattle and sheep uh, on the North Circle Road, um, and, uh, or at least through their droppings, as it were. And, you know, uh, Fitzborough was a real urban village then. Um, I mean, the, that picture that you can see of it there is, is from about 1900 or so. Um, uh, by the way, I'm grateful to Des Gunning for, for supplying me with some of these pictures because I've been so busy since I retired that I didn't even have time to take new ones myself, apart from one that I'll show you later on. Um, and this is the classic view of Fisborough with uh, St. Peter's Church, the Vincentian Church, that I think was designed by J.J. McCarthy um, and, and, and is the highest church spire in Dublin, as you all know, or hopefully know. And I can see it um, lurking almost lurking behind the Jervis Centre from the roof terrace of our apartment building in Temple Bar. Um, and, you know, it, it, it stands for Fibsworth. Um, it, is, it is the most iconic image uh, of the place. But what is most interesting, I think, about this picture really is the kind of world that existed then. Um, you can see a fellow with a bike on the corner um, outside the pub uh, talking to another fellow. Um, you can see people sauntering along the street in the middle of the road. Um, you can see also that the, that the street surface was all cobbled at that stage. Um, that was the standard uh, thing. And you can also see the tram lines and, the, uh, and almost invisibly um, the overhead uh, power cables that supported them. Um, so, you know, Fisborough was, when I, when I was, when I knew it well, um, uh, it was a real urban village. It was the kind of place that people uh, stopped and, and did their shopping and, and so on. And I mean, okay, it's only a mile from the centre of Dublin, but on the other hand, it had a real identity and a real diversity, uh, what's more, along uh, the main streets leading, leading uh, around uh, Doyle's Corner. Um, and that's just a view of... <laughs> <laughs> An extraordinary view of some drover uh, bringing cattle along uh, the North Circle Road. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's a, a bit before my time because the tram is still there. And the trams, of course, were abandoned and, and, uh, in 1949. Uh, so this predates my existence uh, by not very much, actually. Uh, and um, it was something that was very characteristic of the area. And, of course, inevitably, um, it changed. Um, the cattle market is no more and has not been uh, for uh, many, many years. Uh, I just want to go back to that picture of, of, the, of the corner. Um, I still remember standing at the counter. I mean, on the corner, diagonally opposite Doyle's pub was Lipton's. Yeah. Lipton's shop. And I still remember standing there at the counter with my mother uh, while one of the staff sliced ham uh, on, on, on that wonderful, they had an absolutely fantastic slicing machine. Uh, and served it up on greaseproof paper, by the way, at that stage. So no such thing as plastic bags. Um, there was a very dark but busy restaurant uh, in the last building on the terrace of shops on the north side of Fitzborough Road, uh, which we used to go to uh, regularly for, you know, rather awful coffee. But then the coffee that we were having at home was made from, was made using Irol, which was, uh, which was made from chicory and had nothing to do with coffee at all. <laughs> Uh, it was far from coffee beans, it was rare, as they say. Um, and uh, Cleves Toffee, um, as far as I can remember, or some relation of Cleves Toffee, had a small factory of Monk Place. And sometimes, I have to confess, we used to help ourselves to some of it uh, on the way home, rather, rather discreetly. Um, uh, the White Spot uh, shop at Hart's Corner, which many of you will remember, I'm not sure, I think it's either a centre or a spar or whatever it is now. They're all gone to being centres or spars. Um, uh, it used to sell the most wonderful cream buns uh, for us, uh, I mean, especially targeted at school kids. 
Uh, but also, also more wickedly, um, they used to sell single cigarettes, um, <laughs> Woodbine or Sweet Afton or whatever, um, and we experimented with smoking on the banks of the Grand Canal near the Sixth Lock, I think, uh, up from Cross Guns Bridge. Uh, and I clearly remember, I have a lasting memory of, of having, uh, rather incompetently at the age of about 11 or 12 or whatever it was, uh, striking a match, and then the next thing, the whole box, uh, the whole, all of the matches in the box went up in flames, and I singed my eyebrows, and you know the effect of that, you, you have to keep, try, try and keep scraping it out so that your mother wouldn't notice when you, when you went home. Uh, the last thing she would have expected was that uh, we, we, we were smoking cigarettes on the banks of the Royal Canal. Um, we, of course, were aware of the, of the monument um, uh, to the volunteer uh, from... Uh, 1916, um, which is opposite the library, uh, on the filled-in section of the uh, the Royal Canal um, that went all the way to um, Broadstone, um, and it's it's almost impossible to imagine. Really, the library is actually built in um, in what used to be a canal um, a canal basin. Um, we went to the pictures, of course, uh, at that stage. When that photograph was taken, I think, uh, that was the old, the pre-existing um, cinema or theatre that, that existed on the state cinema site. But when we came to know it, of course, it was the state. And the state, in all of its 19, 1950s, late 1950s, early 60s glory, um, when we used to go there after school usually, and they'd have folly or uppers. I don't know whether, uh, some of you may be old enough to remember that, where, you know, it broke off. It was like a serial. It was like a TV uh, sitcom, in a way, uh, usually set in the Wild West, uh, and uh, we, that's how we entertained ourselves uh, at that stage. And that was in the 1960s. That was the old Bohemian. We used to go there too, um, and uh, sadly, that's gone. So is the state, of course. I think I passed it by the other day. As far as I can remember, it's some kind of a, a cheap um, carpet or furniture shop or something like that. Um, is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> with, with a number of charity shops uh, alongside. Um, and, you know, that was way back when, uh, that, that's just uh, my, uh, that would have been around the time when I was smoking cigarettes on the banks of the, Grand, of the Royal Canal. And that's the way I remember cross guns, um, very specifically, where there was a, a, one of these ramshackle, shack-like places on the corner. Uh, that uh, both repaired and sold bicycles. Uh, but that was again part of the whole thing about the kind of services that you expect to find uh, in, in a village. Uh, and, it, and of course it has fantastic historic buildings, um, including the Black Church. This photograph was take, must have been taken in the 1960s before the blocks of flats uh, on Dorset Street were built um, alongside it uh, by Dublin Corporation as it then was. Uh, the Black Church, um, I remember clearly uh, the first de uh, exhibition of the Dublin City Development Plan, uh, the draft development plan from 1967, uh, was held in the Black Church uh, in, in Phippsborough. And we went there. And, you know, that church is remarkable for the fact that it had and still has a parabolic uh, vault. In other words, there's no distinction between the walls uh, and the ceiling. And it has been, I, I thought, fantastically well converted uh, into offices where you still can walk in the door and have a sense of the space, of the volume of the building. Uh, that's, of course, right next door to us here, All Saints, uh, where James Gandon, among others, uh, is buried. Um, and so, you know, you're talking about this is not a mean place. You know, this is a place that has history. Uh, and you can see from this drawing of the proposed post office um, that, uh, you know, a lot of thought went into these things. Um, these, these things just didn't happen accidentally. Uh, and this was a designed a, a, a very fine post office uh, for what was then a very fine uh, a village. Um, and, of course, there are some things that Fisborough has lost, uh, including the aqueduct, uh, that carries the Royal Canal across to, across to uh, Broadstone uh, Station. Um, but I'm very, uh, this is Robert Ballard's picture of Broadstone. Um, I mean, you know, it is fantastic, I think, and it's going to make such a difference now that people will be able to see the station at last, um, now that the petrol station is gone, 
And I know that 10 years ago, somebody from Thistler wrote to me and said, what are we going to do about getting rid of this petrol station? It's just in the wrong place. We really need to you know, show Broadstone off for what it, what it, what it is. And um, that, I'm glad to say, has now happened as a result of the Lewis project. Uh, and I look forward also, and I think this is also going to have a tremendous impact on the place, uh, the relocation of the DIT uh, to Grange Gorm. Uh, because that, um, the Lewis heads up there past Broadstone and through uh, the Grange Gorman uh, site. Um, so that is going to have a remarkably uh, positive impact, I think, on Phippsworth uh, in, the, in the future. Um, but when I, was, when I knew Phippsworth really well and was passing through it every day, it was in the 1960s, and that was at a time when we thought that Le Leakslip and Lucan were really very far away. And little did we know that Dublin was going to sprawl out so much uh, all over Leinster, um, um, uh, and the extent of the city sprawl, which has had an incredible knock-on effect uh, on, on, on every part of Dublin, not least the inner city and the inner suburbs. Um, I mean, this is uh, a terrace of shops. Um, I'm not sure if the, I think they may still exist, but the, not these shops, but the, the actual buildings may still exist. Uh, one of them is vacant, as you can see, and the other one is um, is a, a general store uh, which um, sells everything from a needle to an anchor, it would appear. Uh, and those kind of shops, sadly, are, are now gone. Uh, or like Mick Burns' shop. Um, uh, Mick's son, uh, Jerry, uh, went to school with me uh, in Finston's last Nevin. So I knew, I knew the slave labour element uh, involved in the Mick Byrne operation where the kids were all put to work from time to time. Uh, and then... Um, and then, by complete contrast, you have this, uh, an almost surreal image of something that looks like as if it could be on the edge of Reno, Nevada, um, or the edge of Las Vegas. Not in the middle of Las Vegas, because of course it's, too, it's just too small for that, but on the edge of Las Vegas, you can imagine it there. Um, but as I say, that was at the time before we realized that Dublin was going to sprawl out so much. Um, and this is a picture of one of the motorways, and of course there are any number of motorways now leading into Dublin. Uh, this one, I think, is the one from the west, but it doesn't really matter where it's, where it's, where, which one it is, because the story that it tells is the same. There is so much of Dublin out beyond Dublin that this is what happens in the morning peak period, and there is no prize for guessing which direction Dublin is in in that picture that traffic is all heading for the Dublin area. Not necessarily for the centre of town, but for the M50 ring, for the various business parks and industrial estates and everything else that exist along there. Um, and as a result of that, um, like, and, and by the way, Fitzgerald is not unique in this respect. Uh, like other villages in the inner suburbs, it came to be swamped with the traffic heading to or from places that are further and further out. You know, you're talking about a commuter belt now of 100 kilometers radius from the center of Dublin. Uh, and that has had an incredible knock-on effect in terms of the, um, the, the urban villages that used to exist have really been, have really, as I said, been swamped by it. And so what, it, what the traffic has done, really, is, and this is a picture or a map of Fibsborough from uh, the late 19th century, uh, which shows it still remarkably um, coherent. But what the traffic has had the effect of doing is to turn Fibsborough from a place in its own right into a kind of pit stop on the way to somewhere else. That, and those somewhere else's are further and further away uh, from the city. So the same phenomenon, precisely the same phenomenon, uh, exists in places, to a greater or less extent, uh, in Drumcondra, Clontarf, uh, Donnybrook, Renola, uh, Hurls Cross, um, etc. So the village shops, such as bakers, butchers, grocers, hardware merchants, and so on, uh, supplying all the things that people needed, uh, have just vanished. I think uh, Anne-Marie Horan wrote a great book some years ago uh, during the boom period, uh, which was called She Moved Through the Boom. 
and she tells this story. She was actually in the last pork butcher shop in Renla when it, when it was closing down. It was closing down that day. So the, they were making their own sausages. They had you know, their own supplies of uh, um, stuff, bacon and all the rest of it. And it just closed down and was replaced, I think, by a yeah, shortly a video takeaway shop or whatever, you know. Um, but again, something indigenous that was intended to cater for the local population was replaced by something that was really a kind of like a pit stop um, situation. Takeaways, video stores. A lot of the video stores are gone now, of course, but uh, they were they were briefly um, uh, uh, the hit of the day. Solicitor's office uh, at the ground floor level, where shops used to be. That's, a, that's even the case in Westmoreland Street in the centre of Dublin. So much for having a vibrant uh, retail frontage. You know, the planners talk so much guff, but at the end of the day, you know, what it boils down to is decisions. Decisions on particular applications. And if they're going to allow buildings to be turned into charity shops and, and solicitor's offices, uh, there's really no hope for us. Um, And I mean, you know, like, I don't know, sometimes I give up on them. I, I'll get back to that issue about the planner. <laughs> um, so shopping centres, of course, were to blame for a lot of what happened, uh, because that concentrated retail in a particular area, uh, usually capable of being served by, by cars. Um, and uh, it was, but it was also due, more particularly, to massive residential development in out-of-the-way uh, remote locations uh, very far from, from the city. Um, there was, of course, a local area plan for Fisborough, uh, but like all such plans that were conceived during the boom period, uh, it was wildly ambitious and also pro-high-rise. Uh, the latter uh, element of it was intended to accommodate uh, the appalling plan that was drawn up for the National Children's Hospital on the Matter site, which would have been 16 storeys high, as you probably all know, and would have extended along Eckford Street for a length of 160 metres. You can imagine what that would have been like in Phippsburg. Um, the LAP was also contingent on other things happening that didn't happen, uh, like a replacement prison for Mount Joy, um, out beyond the ward, where the government had spent something like 32 million on a few fields um, during the height of the boom. Uh, to build a prison out there uh, where, in the least accessible location, you, it, it's possible to imagine. Um, but I think we should assume that Mount Joy Prison is going to be staying where it is for the foreseeable future, um, and that it will not become a boutique hotel. <laughs> um, but I think it is very regrettable, and I'm sorry I haven't got a photograph before and after of this, uh, that the new the so, so, well, kind of new women's prison uh, that was built on the North Circle Road frontage, um, that it, it was built across the axis of the prison. In other words, th there used to be a fun, an incredibly terrifying view mm -hmm. of the gates of Mount Joy from the North Circle Road and that avenue that led up to the gates at, directly on the axis of the building was lined by prison officers' housing. In fact, I knew Desi Cusick uh, was one of the uh, one of the sons of prison officers that was at school with me, uh, who was actually living there. All of the prison officers' housing was demolished and replaced by a women's prison, which which was built right across that line. So you cannot see Mount Joy Prison from the North Circle Road. And in my opinion, uh, you know, and this is assuming that we may have money to burn at some point again, uh, that um, uh, that that. I would like to see that view reinstated um, by demolishing or at least reconfiguring uh, the women's prison. Now that may sound wildly idealistic, but I'm just throwing it out there for what it's worth. Um, and which brings us to the Phillipsbury Shopping Centre. Now if you look at this map, if you look at it, which of course should be demolished tomorrow morning. <laughs> If you look at this map, you'll see at the upper section of it there, you see Dalymount, the site that became Dalymount Park. And then in front of it, there was a terrace of single-storey cottages 
uh, which um, fronted onto uh, Fisborough Road and had very long gardens, as you can also see. Uh, and uh, that was um, uh, something actually quite similar to the situation in Donegal, where there was also a terrace of single-storey colleges that were demolished uh, for a rather uh, appalling shopping centre. But no shopping centre in Dublin is as bad as this. <laughs> this, this, I think that the Fibsborough shopping, the building of the Fibsborough shopping centre in 1969, at a time, by the way, when Ballymun was just being finished, um, it's from very much of that period, uh, late 1960s, comprehensive redevelopment. So you tear everything down and you replace it with something new. And the something new that was happened in Fibsworth, this awful, awful scheme, um, has, I think, led to the decline of Fibsworth over the years. It has blighted the image of Fibsworth for decades. People think, when they think of Fibsworth now, they don't think of St. Peter's Church. They think of that bloody block. <laughs> festooned as it now is, and it wasn't in the first instance, by the most extraordinary profusion of TV and 10A, telecommunications, mass, and God knows, mobile phone, and this and that and the other. Um, so, um, you know, it's something that is very much of its time, and it's long past its use-by date, in my opinion. Uh, by the way, just as a matter of interest, it was brought to us by Galen Weston, uh, who in this picture is getting married to a Dublin model called Hilary Frame, uh, and the two of them, uh, I think, probably did very well at the Fibsborough Shopping Centre. Uh, uh, but uh, we, unfortunately, have been left with this hulk of a thing uh, on, on a very important site in the centre of the village. And really, as I said, it needs to be cleared away. Um, not just the tower, the whole lot needs to be taken away. Here, here, here. Every single bit of it. <laughs> Including all of the single story shops and the deck car parking above and so on. And I firmly believe, and I, I'm saying this because I really value streets. Streets are really, really important. That any redevelopment should respect the line of the street. In other words, it should be pulled right out to the, to the back of the footpath and not left with any intervening area between the building facade and the, the, the street itself. Uh, and that any car parking that's required should be at the back and not the front. And it should also be a mixed scheme that includes residential. It's really, really important that there's maybe a hundred apartments provided there on that site, as well as shopping facilities. Um, and, you know, that is something, that is, that's one of the real challenges that faces. Now, I know that there was a scheme done to replace Fibsborough Shopping Centre, or at least to reclad it, or redo it, or reconfigure it in some way. But I don't think that that went far enough. I think, I think actually, the site is so important that there should be a design competition held, uh, an ideas competition. And I would seriously suggest that FizzFest would, get in, would collaborate with, say, the Royal Institute of the Architects of Ireland, who are well used to organizing competitions and, and who, who could do this as an ideas thing. And I'm talking about an ideas competition to reimagine the site of Fizzborough Shopping Centre, especially now that uh, Dublin City Council appears to have uh, bought uh, Daly Mount Park uh, uh, with a view to um, securing its future. Um, there are a lot of excellent suggestions in, in, this, in this book, and, and I'm sure all of you have read it uh, at this stage, but I mean, it's just really a series of photo captions, you know, with people putting forward their own ideas about what should happen to their own area. And there's some wonderful stuff uh, in it, I think, uh, especially the idea, and it's been mentioned earlier on, of stopping all of the traffic at Doyle's Corner in one go. In other words, to have a complete pedestrian crossing there from in whichever direction you want to go, uh, including diagonally, uh, which I always think crossing a junction diagonally is a, a tr gives you a tremendous sense of, of actually being in charge. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's not like being corralled, you know, like some unwanted 
uh, human, you know, at the edge of the street uh, and so on. So um, I think you should also be doing things like campaigning for rates relief, uh, for um, uh, uh, to enable the small businesses to open up in vacant shops. The rates bill that, that small businesses face in this city is absolutely disgraceful and crucifying in some cases. I know of a small vintage clothes shop on the ground floor of our building in Temple Bar which was paying 6000 a year to Dublin City Council in rates. And there was no relief on that or anything else. Now, I mean, if you're faced with that as an upfront expense, you know, like, what chance have you got, you know, to, to pay all the other bills and, you know, make a bit of money for yourself and keep your staff going and so on? Uh, and that shop, by the way, has since closed down. Now, that may not be related to the rates bill, but I'm saying that the rates that are charged by Dublin City Council are criminal in relation to small businesses. They are a major disincentive to anybody taking on any business premises that may be vacant, you know, maybe in, uh, currently in use as a charity shop or whatever, you know, to start off a business, um, you know, they need rates relief and you need, I mean, for example, you know, I was astonished to discover recently that if you were planning on, if you were planning to convert a Georgian house in Marion Square or Fitzwilliam Square or Mountjoy Square or anywhere else uh, into residential use, do you know how much you'd have to pay in development levels to Dublin City Council? Up to six, sorry, 60,000. 60,000? For what? For what? What service are they providing? What does Dublin City Council actually do? You know, um, and I know there's some members of Dublin City Council here, and I don't care. <laughs> You also should be campaigning to keep the post office open and to make sure that it never closes because a post office helps to define a village and if a village doesn't have a post office it's much less of a village uh, than it would be uh, otherwise. Um, and Phippsborough would be robbed of one of the essential elements of village culture if the post office closed. And I'm not even saying that the post office is in danger of closing but you've got to be aware of these risks because it has happened far too much. Uh, in other parts of Ireland. Um, with the proposed designation of Phippsborough as an architectural conservation area, there will be some protection for historic buildings, including the historic buildings that I've mentioned already, but not necessarily of their uses. And you cannot, in my opinion, divorce a building from its use. That is a mistake that happened in Temple Bar, where it didn't really matter what buildings were being used for, so long as they were kept, you know, so what, you know, it's just not, it is, a, a, it is a, an almost bipolar way of looking at the world, um, to divorce buildings uh, from their uses. And wearing my hat as chair of Temple Bar Residence, all I can say is that you're going to have your work cut out for you in dealing with the bureaucratic labyrinth that is Dublin City Council. And I'm not specifically talking about the councillors because they're, well, they're not there all the time, but the officials are there all the time. Because, and what you, what you find is there's an awful lot of talk, an awful lot of talk, and some of the talk is the right kind of talk, but there's feck all action <laughs> at the end of the day. And I can cite one example. Um, Last July, we had a meeting with the Dublin City Manager, or as he now styles himself, Chief Executive, Owen Keegan, a former Director of Traffic in this city, who was excellent as Director of Traffic, uh, but it remains to be seen how good he's going to be as City Manager. And Brendan Penny, one of the Assistant Chief Executives, or whatever they're called now, uh, who's in charge of arts and culture and so on. And we went in there with a list of things, and in fact they knew about the list in advance because we sent the list to them of all of the things that we wanted Dublin City Council to address or that we wanted to work with Dublin City Council to address. And they totally disarmed us at the beginning of the meeting by saying that there wasn't a single thing, not one thing in our entire programme that they disagreed with. <laughs> not one thing. And that they were going to work with us and they'd be delighted to work with us and everything else. And nine months later, do you know what has happened? Nothing. Nothing has happened. Nothing 
except for the busking bylaws, which some of the councillors present here voted for, um, and which are very far below what we would have wanted as residents of Temple Bar. Um, and they come into effect on the 9th or the 7th of April or something like that. Now, reference was made to um, the design manual for urban roads and streets. I would urge any of you who haven't read it, including perhaps some of the elected representatives, uh, to read it, because it is a revolutionary document in terms of how it deals with the priorities that should exist on the streets as between pedestrians and traffic and public transport and cyclists and all the rest of it. It is a really, really life-affirming document, in my opinion, uh, and something that ought to be implemented and is now official policy. But guess what? The engineers in Dublin City Council have not read it and they don't know what's in it. Or if they do know what's in it, they are not doing anything to implement it. In fact, they're doing the reverse. They are still devoted to those sheep pen railings that appear at pedestrian crossings, the way they try and force you to turn left and right and all the rest of it, you know, as if you were sheep about to be shorn. No, we must reject this kind of thinking. We must reject their antiquated views. We must demand, you know, a progressive approach to the development of the city, one that puts people first rather than vehicles. And the tragedy for Dublin in the past has been that the vehicles have always been put first. That's one of the reasons why the trams went. It was to make room for vehicles. We've been making room for vehicles for far too long. We need to make room for people. Thank you.